Buddha's teachings don't start with a first principle. They start with a last principle. The Buddha's own experience of total freedom from suffering. And everything works back from that. On the one hand, he reflected on what he had to do in order to get there. But he also had to reflect on how to make his teachings persuasive. How could he get other people to attain the same total freedom? And one of his strategies was to work with a desire that we most of us have at least, maybe not all of us, but most of us have, which is the desire for happiness, the desire for pleasure, which sometimes gets dismissed simply as being hedonistic and lazy and of not much spiritual value. But he discovered that if you could take that desire and really take it seriously, do you really want to be happy? What's involved in really being happy? For one, you'd like a happiness that's reliable. A happiness that doesn't turn on you. So what does that happiness require? Well, one, it, it requires that it be founded on something that's not going to turn on you. And secondly, in the search for that happiness, you can't harm others. Because if your happiness depends on their harm, they're not going to stand for it. Then you have to trust in your own ability to do this. In other words, you have to believe in action, that your actions are real and they really do have results, and that they're not totally determined. You can change your ways of acting. Otherwise, if they were totally determined from the past, you'd have no choices. That would make you give up right there. So that's the beginning of wisdom. Compassion, of course, is that realization your happiness can't depend on the suffering of, of others. Then finally is the quality of purity, in which you really do make sure that your actions don't cause any suffering or any harm. You have to reflect on your actions again and again and again. This requires a lot of work. It does develop good qualities of mind, wisdom, compassion, purity. These are honorable things. This is one of those pursuits of happiness that isn't just hedonistic. You're developing good qualities of mind. And of course, another quality that you need to develop is patience. Because if your idea of happiness is the quickest pleasure possible, you're never going to get anywhere. You have to be able to work for goals and have the endurance that will see you through. The Buddha's first summary of his teachings, this was after he had converted the, the followers of the Gossip of Brothers. Sariputta, Moggallana, and all of the, their fellow students who come from another teacher after they'd become our hunts. The Buddha gave a sermon on Makabucha. It's called the Owada Bhatimukha. We don't have a record of the sermon, but all we have is a record of the verses that the Buddha used to summarize the main points of the sermon at the end. And the very first one starts with patient endurance. In other words, you have to learn how to be patient, you have to learn how to endure, you have to learn how to stick with things, because this is a path that's going to take time. You can't let yourself get diverted by the least little pleasures that come past. In fact, you can't let yourself get diverted by major pleasures that come past that are going to pull you off the path. And that requires a pragmatic kind of wisdom. How do you motivate yourself to stick with it? especially when the results aren't coming immediately. How do you take pleasure in the fact that you're sticking with a path like this? The various ways that the Buddha uses to motivate people. 
primary is a sense of craft. He often compares all the different skills you need to develop on the path with the skills of archers and cooks, carpenters, musicians, people who learn to take pride in their craft and enjoy doing th things well. So it's not just the happiness that comes from having completed the work, but learning how to enjoy the work while you're doing it. And so think of the meditation that we're doing right now as a kind of craft. That means developing a certain sort of resilience. Not sitting and simply wishing, may it work, may it work, may it work, whatever you're doing, but saying, I'm going to try this to see if it does work. And if it doesn't work, I've learned. And be ready to learn that something may work, may not work, or may work sometimes and not work at other times. One of the biggest mistakes you can make as a meditator is to find something that works for a little while and then doesn't seem to work, and then just throw it away. What you found was something that's useful in certain circumstances, and you want to remember that in case those circumstances come up again. That's a concept that comes with craftsmanship, which may sound strange to us in our modern romantic attitudes towards craft. It's something that's called the dignity of obedience. There are skills that you can pick up from other people. And you don't insist immediately that, well, I want to do things my way or I want to explore things my way. First you have to learn the basic skills that you need to really do a good exploration. And so that you also learn how to be a good judge of what's good craftsmanship and what's not. In the old days of the medieval guilds, there was a certain pride in learning how to do things just as the Master had done. Not necessarily that you do that forever, but if you've learned how to pick up those skills, then you're in a position to expand on them. But if you grope around without having developed those skills, how can you trust your own powers of judgment? And you're missing a good opportunity. So there's a certain pride that comes in listening to the Buddhist teachings and really giving them a fair chance. And learning how to adapt your ways of thinking and acting and speaking so they fit in with the standards of the Buddha, not insisting that you want to change the Dharma to suit your own ways. I mean, there are ways that the Dharma can be expanded. I mean, you've got all the great Ajans. They don't just quote texts at you. They have their own idiosyncratic ways of explaining the Dharma, but it comes out from their having mastered the basic skills. That's what gives it authenticity. So that's one of the ways you can motivate yourself, is learning how to take pride in your craftsmanship. The obverse of that, of course, is developing a sense of shame, a healthy sense of shame. When you think about doing things that you know are not in line with the craft, you should feel a sense of shame about it that you would be ashamed to do that. This doesn't mean you say, I'm a horrible person, I'm a miserable slob. But simply, you're above that kind of behavior. It's one of the most destructive attitudes that you see nowadays is the idea, well, shame is bad for people, so we should try to make sure they don't feel any sense of shame. Like the drug counselor met up in Vancouver. He was doing his best to get the drug addicts to come in and see him. They were offering free counseling. And he found the only way he could do that was to try to make the drug addicts feel good about themselves. And after several years of this, he was saying, you know, this is not getting them off the drugs, because they feel good, in, uh, good about themselves. The fact that they're drug addicts, it's okay. It's a sense of shame that makes you a better person. together with a sense of shame. The Pali word for shame and is hiri, goes together with otapa, a sense of compunction. When 
you see a course of action that you know is going to harm somebody, you want to develop a twinge of conscience, let's put it that way. Did you really feel bad about doing that? That's your moral sense speaking to you. So shame and compunction are two other ways that you can motivate your motivate yourself and make yourself take joy in the fact that okay, I'm acting in a way that's not harming anybody, I'm acting in a way that's honorable. There's a pleasure in that. There's a satisfaction in that, that even if you haven't reached the end of the path, at least you're behaving in an honorable way. This is a path that harms no one. It develops good qualities of mind. Again, that sense of honor that goes with the craft. and keeps shame from becoming debilitating. The major motivator, though, is heedfulness. Realizing that if I don't work on my mind, if I don't develop these good qualities, there's going to be suffering down the line, big time. And you can ask yourself, do you really love yourself? Yes. Do you want to suffer? No. You make the voices that ask those questions the dominant parts of your mind. In other words, you don't kill your sense of shame, you don't kill your sense of compunction, you don't kill your sense of heedfulness. You take them seriously. The sense of heedfulness is the opposite of apathy, that says, I don't really care which is the way that some people think not having no preferences is. As well, it doesn't matter, it's okay, whatever comes up. Heedfulness says, no, if I've got it within my power, then this is one of the things you have to learn how to accept. You do have it within your power to make a difference. Are you going to abandon that ability? Are you going to pretend that you don't have it? Now, what are you going to think when you suffer down the line? You look back on the choices you could have made but you didn't make because you were too lazy or whatever to stick with them. So these are some of the ways in which the Buddha has you motivate yourself to develop that patience. So you actually do find a sense of joy, a sense of well-being, even at the points where the path seems pretty hopeless, that you seem pretty hopeless. You're not getting the results you want, the defilements are yapping at your heels, whispering in your ears, saying, hey, come on. You want to have other voices in your mind that say, hey, look, you really do want to take pride in your craftsmanship. Even though you haven't finished the table, you know you're working on a good table. Instead of thinking how many more steps it's going to take before the table is done, take each step and do it as skillfully as you can. And take joy in the skill, realizing that this is the way that you can keep your own best interests in mind. You're alert to the dangers out there. You're alert to the dangers in your own mind. But you realize that you're on the path that takes you beyond them. And whether the results come quickly or come slowly is not the issue. The fact is that you stay on the path. And you nurture all the voices in the mind that give you the energy to stay on the path. This is how you're a true friend to yourself, and that you can ultimately taste that last principle, which is what gives Buddhism all of its worth. And the Buddha talked about the, the essence or the heartwood of the teachings. It's the fact that release is true, and it is absolute. 
there's something of substantial and essential worth to it. And everything else the Buddha taught derives its worth from that fact. If you're going to reach that essence, though, you have to make yourself a worthwhile person. And you want to develop the wisdom not only to see that what the Buddha is talking about is a good thing, but you know how to talk yourself into actually sticking with the path. <laughs>